Good morning, everybody. I'm Strobe Talbot, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here this morning for a conversation with Dick Costello. Uh, as you're going to, well, as all of you obviously already know, this is a guy who's all about uh, innovation. Uh, and Dick, I didn't have a chance to tell you this in the other room, but you are responsible for a major innovation from this podium. This is the first time in 11 years, and probably the first time in whatever it is, 97 years, that uh, the president of Brookings has appeared at this lectern without a tie. <laughs> now, clearly, Jonathan Rausch did not get the word. But, um, and, and by the way, next time you come back, well, let's both lose the jackets as, as well. Uh, I think the sartorial innovation is actually uh, kind of a welcome thing here on the banks of the Potomac. There are a lot of things that could be fixed here, and maybe if you brought a little bit more of the ethos of the Bay Area, uh, this place, Washington, D.C., would work uh, even better. But uh, Dick actually brings more than just a fresh note of how we ought to dress here in Washington. He's going to talk to us today in conversation with Jonathan about a revolution in communications, networking, politics, governance, and of course, commerce and entrepreneurship. Twitter is only seven years old. Dick joined as COO in 2009 and became CEO the following year. There are now, as I think all of you know, about, what is it, 200 million active users uh, who are tweeting uh, something like 500 million uh, times a day. A few of those have even come from me, and any of you in the audience who know me might find that as astonishing as I do. Uh, I've only been at this for nine months. And uh, I've already developed a sense of competition uh, with others who are out there. I have to acquire another 9,900, I'm sorry, nine, 992,577 followers in order to catch up with Dick Costello. <laughs> but I've got some consolation in that he's got to get another 32 million in order to catch up with Barack Obama, which tells you something about the role of Twitter in governance and politics. I got to confess that I started out uh, being of a certain age and a certain background, uh, always having worn a tie, uh, to being very skeptical about Twitter when I first heard about it. I had to be uh, pushed, some would say even dragged kicking and screaming into the use of Twitter but now I am really glad uh, to be part of this community. And that's for a couple of reasons, one of which I was discussing with Dick uh, before we came in here. And that is that being on Twitter has considerably both deepened and broadening, broadening, uh, broadened my, uh, my reading habits. It's exposed me particularly through smart tweets, and there are a lot of those out there, and the links that go with them to publications that hadn't been part of my life uh, before. And it's also allowed me to engage in conversation with people all around the world on subjects that we have in common, although we very often have different views about. As for the Brookings Institution, Twitter has become key to what we do and how we do it. It's given us an uh, understanding of the role that Twitter has played not only in our domestic politics in this country, but also around the world. And everybody here is, of course, aware of the role that Twitter played in the uh, protests after the uh, phony elections in Iran in 2009 and during the uh, Arab Awakening, not to mention its importance in the 2012 presidential election in this country. It's also instrumentally very valuable for us at Brookings because it give us, gives us a way of promulgating our product, broadening our audience, and enhancing our impact. Uh, just yesterday, for example, a number of us here at Brookings used Twitter 
to call attention to a new feature on our website called the Brookings Essay, which is an attempt to help resuscitate long-form uh, essay and journalism, and thus give us kind of a, an anchor to windward in more traditional uh, kinds of communication as we uh, sail into the uh, future of uh, social media. So now I'm going to turn the proceedings uh, over to my colleague, uh, Jonathan Rausch, who is a senior fellow in governance studies. Uh, and in the spirit uh, of the topic today, that conversation is going to include as many of you as possible. Uh, over the years, this is another Twitter-induced uh, uh, in innovation. I've always ended uh, these introductions by saying, uh, please uh, turn off your mobiles and your cell phones. Uh, I'm looking at a number of you who are clearly not going to do that, and all of you are welcome to keep, uh, as long as they're in a silent mode, your, uh, your devices at hand so that you can uh, uh, tweet uh, this event. Uh, and that is uh, at hashtag uh, Twitter CEO. And if you want to send a direct message to Dick himself, it is at Dick C. That's not Dixie, that's Dick C. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Strobe. Thank you, Dick. It's a pleasure to have you at Brookings. Thank you all for coming. We'll talk for 20, 25 minutes and then open it up. We're taking questions via Twitter. We're taking questions in the room. The main rule is please don't filibuster. Our time together here is short. The usual first question, de rigueur, is when is the IPO? I'm not going to ask you that today. In fact, I don't even want you to tell us, even if you choose to. Um, topic one in Washington is data mining, the NSA, the Snowden crisis, and everything else. Um, I know there are restrictions on what you can say. But tell us what your life has been like. What's been going through your head as CEO of a major information company since this story broke? Um, <clears throat> so I think we've been very clear about having a um, and articulated a very principled policy around um, access to user data, which I will summarize as when, you know, uh, when we receive uh, valid legal requests um, uh, in the countries in which we operate, you know, we will abide by the rule of law, but uh, our, our stance is that when, when uh, and, those, and those are specific legal requests, we will abide by the rule of law and do what, uh, uh, comply with that uh, legal request. Other requests that may be more broad in scope and not specific legal requests uh, that don't meet our principle of being a specific valid legal request, uh, we will push back on. And I think we've been very clear about that. We're very transparent about uh, the requests we get and react to. Um, and we've published those uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Google. It publishes theirs as well. Um, we would like to see more companies publish those. Uh, we've got another transparency report for the six months ending about a week from now, coming out probably in about a month, I think. Uh, and so people can see uh, how the kinds of requests we get and how we respond to them. Can you tell us anything about what's true or false about the information out there about Twitter and, uh, and these programs? For example, you were, Twitter was not mentioned on the famous PRISM slide. Do you feel dissed by that? <laughs> <laughs> so I would just go back to, I, I kind of tried to uh, speak to that in my first answer. Um, I think we have a very, um, we have a very specific, uh, what we feel is a principled uh, approach to this which is that um, we will comply with specific valid legal requests and we, you know, we stick to that line pretty, pretty, pretty hard and push back on uh, things that, don't, uh, that, aren't, that aren't specific valid legal, legal requests. Um, and I think we've, you know, I think uh, historically people have seen the kinds of, uh, the kinds of attention and uh, uh, user privacy rights that we've defended um, in other, in other uh, cases like the WikiLeaks case and, uh, and others. You have actually fought some of these measures, yes? You, were, uh, you fought a gag order that was attached uh, to one of these orders some time ago. Yeah, well, well I guess what I, would, what, I would, um, what I would say, generally speaking, is we feel that our, um, our users have a right to know when their information is being requested, and some of those, some of those uh, 
cases that we have fought are requests for user information that have resulted in us wanting to say, we feel that the users should be informed that their information is being requested so that they can fight that request if they wish. Um, and uh, those are the kinds of ways we think about this, right? We just feel that um, uh, the users, these kinds of users should know when their information is being requested. Has uh, Twitter's pushing back on this elicited any negative uh, problems uh, with the government? Um, well, so again, generally speaking, I would say no, uh, because we're sort of, we're engaging in, you know, uh, engaging in a discussion about the, uh, uh, the, the policy and the rule of law in the, in, in the country. And again, this is not just a uh, not just something that we deal with in the U.S. now. We have to deal with this in all the countries in which we operate. Um, and, uh, you know, as you might expect, uh, the laws in other countries are very, very different yeah. in regard to these matters. And uh, so we're, I would say our policy internationally is, uh, is evolving as we learn to understand the ways in which we have to take our, our general principle to these uh, different places in which we operate. It's got to be very hard. You're dealing yes. with an internet, a global service sure. in countries. How many countries? Well, Hundreds you know, some countries. They uh, yeah. all have different standards and different laws. How in the heck do you navigate that? Well, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process, and we're, we're learning and, and, I think, getting better at it. Um, you know, there are, again, specific, specific laws, country-specific laws that we comply with in the countries in which we operate, and then there are um, the ways in which uh, certain uh, broad requests are made in different countries that we are kind of discerning how to go deal with in, in, the, diff in the different sorts of countries. I, I would say that initially we, um, we were maybe a bit um, a bit too, uh, uh, a bit too uh, 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 parochial, I guess, maybe, the, maybe a word, in the way in which we pr approached it, taking our uh, sort of local uh, uh, headquarter office perspective and saying, well, we'll just do the same thing we do, we do here. And obviously, we've had, to, we've had to realize that that wasn't necessarily the right way to deal with things internationally. Uh, how much bandwidth does it take at Twitter dealing with laws, regulations, privacy? This must be a substantial portion of... We, yeah, we have the, the, right our general counsel, Alex McGillivray, has a, a significantly sized team that spends a good deal of time on this. And I'm guessing it comes up in your day pretty regularly. It, it comes up fairly regularly, yes. <laughs> There's a poll out uh, just the other day uh, from Allstate National <coughs> Journal Heartland Monitor. I don't know if you saw it, but the results are interesting because this is a poll that was taken before the NSA story broke. So none of that is taken into account. And it finds that a majority of adults believe the explosive increase in data available to business, law enforcement, and government is more negative than positive. That's 55% negative. Nine in 10 people believe the next generation will have even less privacy than they do now. 48% want more commitment by companies not to share users' information. Um, and uh, social media ranks last 14 out of 14 institutions that were asked about on the question of trust to responsibly use information about you. So there's a big trust gap forming out there with the public in terms of privacy. But here's the odd thing. They are fatalistic about it. They say they don't want a lot of government intervention, and they don't really believe much can be done about it. So I mean, we find, you find yourself in this, in this environment where people are pessimistic about privacy. I think that the transparency reports um, go a long way toward helping people understand precisely what kind of, when you don't have any idea what sorts of information is being requested, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can assume anything you want to assume. So the transparency report that we provide and the ability for anyone to go look at that up on a website makes it much easier for people to see, oh, okay, I, now I understand these are the kinds of things that are being requested. These were the kind of requests that were, you know, rejected as not legally valid. These are the kinds of requests that were, oh, that makes sense. That was a valid legal request for a very specific thing, uh, pointing to some illegal piece of content. I, that makes sense to me. I get that. So I, I think it is important, as I said earlier, for more organizations to, um, uh, participate, in the, participate in these transparency, uh, these transparency reports because it goes a long way toward helping people understand what exactly is going on, and you know, and then they can then it's you know 
to be perfectly frank, you can then disagree or agree with the specifics instead of some assumption that may or not may not be true. We've got another one coming out a couple weeks. Yes, in just a few weeks. I think it'll be based on the last six months ending about a week from now. now you all joined Google, I think, and some other companies in asking the government for permission to reveal more than you've been allowed to. Uh, we were, I think that was sort of anecdotally, one of our attorneys jumped in on, a, on, on, on Twitter uh, based on some conversation between a couple other companies. We, I don't think we've done anything formally there. How much more would you like to be reportable for the industry in general than currently? Are? Again, I think, like, I, I, I really sincerely believe that transparency in so many of these things uh, goes a long way toward helping people have context for what exactly is going on. Um, and I think that can be done, you know, okay, so then you have to say, go down to the next step and say, well, if we're transparent about, you know, the requests that are being made, then that will help people understand what they, you know, how to uh, navigate around that. I think there are ways to be transparent about uh, the requests that are being made without, you know, harming the sort of uh, 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 needs of the intelligence organizations. Is there a better way to think about privacy than we do traditionally in this world where, you know, everyone's relinquishing I, I, data all the time? I think that this is going to be a constantly evolving thing, particularly with the um, just tremendously rapid migration to mobile. So I think that you will see, I mean, maybe sort of fairly obvious, lots of um, emerging uh, uh, discussion about um, geolocation, as people's location is constantly broadcasted, and uh, issues or policies emerge around that. So I think it's going to start to have to evolve very, very quickly as these capabilities become ubiquitous and, you know, everybody from, you know, your seven-year-old to, to, to whoever is, is walking around broadcasting uh, uh, with a device that's broadcasting location. So I think that the discussion will need to catch up to this very quickly, but I think it will continue to evolve and we'll see we'll see more of it, not less of it. So when you said that people are sort of fatalistic about it, I do think you'll see more discussion about this. Have you given any thought to a sort of successor regime for privacy? I, in, what, in what of, respect? Well, you know, a lot of people say that with all this data being relinquished voluntarily, that thinking about privacy the way the law traditionally has, you know, you've got your home and you've got copper wires and all that's protected, but what you tell someone else is not private. This no longer makes sense when you can aggregate data. So people talk about standards around use rather than collection and so on. Any of that surfaced on your radar? Um, again, I think this stuff will evolve over time. And we'll see how it we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, we're very uh, our our you, our geo uh, our geo location services opt in. You opt in before you you know you, have, you 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 select that you want to start broadcasting where you're tweeting from, et cetera. And I think that. Um, that will that something like that will emerge as, uh, yeah, as a standard. The interesting thing about Twitter is so much of it is by definition already transparent. I mean, yeah, it's all out yeah, there. That, you can that, look at it. That's right. It's it's a it's very you know we 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 like to say Twitter is the global town square. It's all public, uh, real time, conversational, and widely distributed. And public is the first word in there. So the fact that it's all public and broadcast and not. Uh, you know, uh, uh, private network uh, conversation makes some of these things easier for, uh, 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 easier for us to deal with. Global town square, a sort of planetary conversation. Is that how you, what is Twitter fundamentally? You're dealing with someone, I'm a newbie to Twitter, a lot of people in Washington are. We're sort of the last redoubt of the old everything. What is Twitter in your yeah. mind? Yeah, I, I, you, 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 you just said it. Um, I, we think of it as the global town square, right? This notion of a very, um, Again, public, live, in the moment, conversational uh, uh, platform. And I think that um, that is, those characteristics put together differentiate us from, from everything else that may be one or two, but not all of those things. It's mobile, right? It's in your pocket, it goes with you. It's, it's mobile it and it's increasing. It's mobile and it's increasingly mobile. Our usage is. Um, has been primarily mobile for a while and is increasingly mobile. The fascinating thing about our mobile users, maybe, maybe not surprising that they, that they use it more than desktop users, but the fascinating thing about our mobile users is that they do everything more. They favorite things more, they retweet more, they reply more, et cetera. So I think that this migration to mobile is something that very much favors services like Twitter uh, and, 
and we'll, we'll see how that evolves. Is, is this part of what's driving, you know, Twitter keeps popping up in social revolutions and change around the world. Is this why? Because it's in your pocket, it's always with you, it's so easy to tweet, and it's so easy to retweet? Well, I think it's the, I think it's the combination of all those characteristics, right, that make it this, this town square. Um, the town square happens to be a particularly uh, good place to aggregate uh, uh, and protest, right? And so you can have these direct conversations with everybody uh, in the moment, in real time, that feel similarly about some issue or certainly want to debate some issue. So that town square um, aspect of it is, I think, I think why people take to it as a platform for organizing things like protests. There's a marvelous documentary I just saw about Ai Weiwei, the Chinese dissident. Yeah. The Chinese authorities cut off his internet years ago, his you know, standard web access. They could not or did not cut off his Twitter feed. That's what he uses. Yeah, um, we, he's been, um, he's spoken very, very eloquently about Twitter on a number of occasions. Um, we've had even video clips of the kinds of things he's said about it, played in the office at our All Hands meetings several times. Um, he's, you know, I, he's a big supporter of the platform and a big fan of it, and, Makes you wonder and, and if, you I know, of him. Twitter had been around in 1776, with the Declaration of Independence had been written in 140 characters. All men are created equal, hashtag equality. <laughs> um, here's a fact that maybe you didn't know about Twitter. This is also uh, from the National Journal Allstate Heartland Monitor poll. You have to say all that in Washington. Poll's very sensitive. 18% um, of users, this is a polling sample, a population sample, 18% have used Twitter in the last month. That's kind of astonishing. It's almost one in five adults surveyed in this poll are on Twitter. Yeah, uh, uh, we have uh, every belief in the, inside the company that, um, that we have an obligation to reach every person on the planet. You know, we saw time after time, whether it's things like you just mentioned, organizing protests or, uh, or you know, emergency relief in the aftermath of the earthquake and ensuing tsunami in Fukushima, Japan, that it is a particularly great service at broadcasting um, uh, necessary conversation. And so uh, places that we can't get to and people that we don't get to yet, uh, we want to be able to get to and we'll do everything we can do to get to them. Do the trends look like linear or exponential or hitting it, saturation it, it, or what? It, it changes. Um, there, are seasonal, there are seasonal trends to growth where you'll see inflection points uh, seasonally. Um, there are uh, holiday trends to growth. You know, new devices come out and you'll see the, you'll see the growth inflection change. There are country specific inflection points around things like, you know, events, so the events in, uh, the events in uh, Turkey and Brazil, elections uh, cause uh, uh, increases in, uh, in uh, active usage, et cetera. So there are all sorts of interesting trends that drive, um, that drive inflection points and growth. Certain, uh, we call them VITs, very important tweeters. Uh, certain celebrities or, or kinds of accounts that jump into a platform will cause um, a dramatic in, dramatically increased usage. Um, uh, teams in the Bundesliga and the German soccer league participating and it caused a, you know, a, a rapid increase in growth in Germany. Once so people there are all sorts of different things sticky, that happen. sticky, right? Once people get in, they tend to stick around. I would say that once you are using, once you are a core user of Twitter, it becomes increasingly indispensable to you. So that's obviously another great, so uh, great trend for us. On everyone on the planet, you probably won't get everyone. Um, is there a saturation point out there for this medium? I don't think so, no. I guess eventually it's part of your phone's operating system and it, you know, it's just running in our lives in the background. Uh, if it were, if it, if that were be, if that were the case, that would be just fine with us. <laughs> you wouldn't mind that a bit. So, where do you go with a service like this? I mean, you've you, people people know how it works. It's developed its own argot. What's what's next for Twitter? Um, there are lots of ways we can enhance that global town square experience. Um, I just talked about things like uh, unplanned events, natural disasters, um, protests, et cetera, versus I, I, I uh, uh, contrast that to a planned event like the Super Bowl. We know when it is, who the participants are, et cetera. Um, and that um, ability to track and monitor the moments within an event um, 
either as they happen or to catch up with them is something we want to enhance. So, for example, uh, last night, again, uh, the filibuster in Texas was, you know, the number one uh, <laughs> trending topic nationally here in the U.S. on Twitter. Um, and that was an amazing thing that if you were following on Twitter, it was fascinating to watch. We want to make that experience even better. So sort of curating the moments within the event, um, the media from it, um, and being, making that much easier to navigate. Can you be and, more specific about how you could do that? Well, so uh, from right now, you get purely the uh, reverse chronological order of the tweets, and you kind of kind of go all the way through them. It would be nice to see things like a uh, graphic of spikes in the conversation and what time did they happen and oh there were a half hour ago there was a big spike in the conversation about this particular trend and be able to peel back you know kind of scroll back to that time and see what see what happened at that particular moment. Uh, you can start to think about in the context of, start to think about that in the context of planned events like televised events um, that people might be uh, watching on a, a delayed basis and so forth and being able to sort of follow along with Twitter uh, in a DVR mode would be, would be interesting. So be those are the a, kinds of things we're experimenting sort with. Sort of a two-layer sort of system where you can monitor the, the substance of the conversation and the trends in the conversation. Yeah, that's right. back and forth Precisely. in parallel levels. That's right. And this is in the works or developed? It's something we're experimenting with. I think that when, when I, I've been talking about, you know, Twitter and events uh, and, and Twitter as the second screen for TV for a while. And we're, we're playing around with different models and different ideas, but you'll see us continue to do a bunch of work there. Um, one of the fascinating things about Twitter and events is, is this. You know, people will frequently ask me, well, how do you surface the signal from the noise, right? There are, if there are 500 million tweets a day and then the Super Bowl is on and, or the Olympics are happening or the World Cup's happening, both, both two, two things that are going to happen next year in Brazil, you know, how can you, you know, when Brazil scores a goal in a soccer game and everyone in Brazil tweets goal, right, like, and you have to scroll through, you know, how do you surface the signal from that? And so the fascinating thing about that, we tried a couple things during the Olympics where we said, well, we'll just curate the really high authority accounts of you know, the, the commentators and the athletes, and we'll pull those tweets out and show those as the event, and that'll be interesting, and you won't have to uh, dig through everything else. And the amazing thing about that was that you lost the roar of the crowd that really made Twitter feel like Twitter. It sort of right? out. It, it, it just felt, um, yeah, it felt like, you know, you know when you're in a, in a in a cosmopolitan city, city like this in your hotel room and you throw the window open and you can hear what's going on. It felt like, you know, you were in a very, very quiet studio uh, and every once in a while something was being uh, beamed in. And so it lost that roar of the crowd that makes it, um, it makes it the yeah, public town you're square. More of an aggregator and less of yeah, a suddenly direct. more of an aggregator and less of the public town square. So we need to be able to maintain that roar of the crowd while surfacing these moments, and that's the kind of thing we're trying to do with the experiments we're running. Yeah, I'm a new user. I have trouble with the noise. It's, you know, it, it, it goes fast, and if you miss something, it's gone, and it's hard to find the good stuff in that stream. Uh, maybe I'm not following the right people, but, uh, but I'd like to see ways to get to the stuff that interests me faster without, without losing the raw experience. Yeah, I'm very excited about the uh, 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 the kinds of things we're trying out now, and that uh, uh, that we're we're publicly experimenting with, and and we'll see where they take us. It's also interesting this business. People are tweeting while they watch TV, and you start to wonder: Will sort of life develop this meta layer where we've got the layer at which we do things, and then the layer at which we watch things, and then the layer at which we watch what we watch? Well, I think of, I think about it. I think about it this way. You know, um, our. Uh, uh, Deb Roy, the founder of Bluefin Labs, the company we acquired, likes to call Twitter the social soundtrack for TV. Um, and I think that there's always been this desire to talk about the things we're experiencing. It used to just be that you could only talk about them with the people either in the room or the next, you know, the quote unquote water cooler the next day at work. And now when you have the ability to talk about them with the people everywhere else in the world who are, who are watching it, and some of the authorities on the subject, and some of the participants in that sport or the politic or the, you know, the, uh, the domain experts who are also commenting on it and directly interact with them, that's fascinating, right? I mean, again, when you think about the, the I use the public town square um, for a specific reason. It used to be the case in the town square 
before, you know, thousands of years ago in the Greek Agora, that that's where you went to find out what was going on and talk about it, right? You came and, and talked about what was going on in your part of the village, and I came and talked about what was going on in mine, and the politician was there, and we listened to the issues of the day, and the musician was there, and the, the preacher was there, etc. And it was multi-directional, and it was unfiltered, and it was inside out, meaning the, the news was coming from the people it was happening to, not some observer. And you know, along comes the printing press, and then radio, and then t television, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these advances in technology are in service to removing the friction of distance and time in distributing the information. So we got to the point, ultimately, you know, with you know, CNN worldwide news, uh, uh, that uh, you've completely eliminated the friction of, of time and distance. And then along comes uh, a service like Twitter that that has the elimination of time and distance built into it, um, but also brings back all those capabilities of the Agora. It's inside out again. It's coming from the participants. I think through all this is changes the experience of watching TV and doing stuff, right? Because, you know, in the Greek Agora, you're there. You're in the square. You're nowhere else. If I'm watching TV and tweeting about it, I'm in the room. I'm also in the TV experience, and I'm in the, third, I'm in the Twitterverse all at once, sort of navigating all these three levels. I have to tell you that for me, it is for, absolutely for me now the case that when I'm watching some major event on television, if I don't have my device with me and I'm, and I'm not on Twitter during it, I feel like I'm like watching it with the volume off. <laughs> Increasingly common, I'm sure. Well, of course, this event is all about me. Uh, so I want to know, is this curtains for me? I'm a long-form journalist. I write narrative for places like The Atlantic, the world's second oldest journal. We are at Brookings, the world's oldest think tank. We specialize in the idea that people want to sit and think and be in that experience and not be distracted and really work something through. Twitter's 140 characters. It's fast. It's instant. It's distracting. Is this, is this the end of my business model? Is it the end of concentration? Is it ADD forever? N n no. And I'll answer that on All right. yeah, good. And I'll answer that on two, on two uh, sort of axes. One, I think that there's a, I don't, I don't agree with the hypothesis that because it's like uh, 140 characters uh, and it's short, that it's uh, that it's that it's that it's distracting or or uh, uh, causing us to not be thoughtful about things, et cetera. So there are some incredibly Thoughtful and eloquent 140 character tweets. You know, the author Salman Rushdie is one of the amazing users of the platform and, and speaks eloquently about things like character development and the difference between uh, novelists on it. Um, but the, but the, to the first part of the question, um, we are not going to be in the business period of, of synthesizing, analyzing. And I've already, I've already told you, we proved to not particularly like the way uh, uh, we were curating experiences on Twitter. We're going to be the platform that distributes this information that the hundreds of millions of people around the world who use it want to talk about. I think it's the journalists and the news organizations in the world who will take all this information and analyze it and curate it, curate it and synthesize it as they have always done. Um, yes, it may be the case that, well, people are breaking these stories on Twitter now. And so, you know, we're not going to be, we may or may not anymore be the first place to break something. But uh, look, that it's now the case that when anyone when something is broken in a uh, uh, on on some uh, on on some televised news show uh, that the other everybody else picks it up instantaneously anyway and the advantage is in the real journalism the synthesis analysis and curation of what's going on uh, so i think that that's all of that advantage and benefit of journalism doesn't go away at all and is increasingly important because you do have a uh, a lot of information coming in at once, and there have to be some organizations that are synthesizing it and, and thinking about it and, and analyzing it and writing up those analyses or broadcasting those analyses. Well, let's go to the audience. Before we do, a sign went up a bit earlier saying that the Supreme Court has ruled the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional. No precedent on gay marriage in Proposition 8, as was expected. Um, 
And uh, same-sex marriage will, as a result, be legal again in California. Only you guys filed, uh, signed on to a brief supporting the overturning of the Defense of Marriage Act, if I'm not mistaken. So this is good news for Twitter. Why? So I think that um, the, the brief that we signed on to with hundreds of other companies, uh, I think is correct, um, was all about, oh, look, we just want to have a... Um, some understanding of, uh, uh, of consistency in the way we're going to be able to, you know, uh, 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 we've got employees all over the place, and we want to have some sort of consistent way of, of, of knowing how we're going to be able to deal with these things, um, and which is what that brief specifically was about. In our, in our, in our own case, now separating ourselves from that, from that particular brief, we've been uh, very supportive uh, and uh, as a company uh, with our own employees, of uh, of these of these progressive policies in the in the state of California, et cetera. Thank you. I'm gay. I'm married. I appreciate that. Uh, let's go to the audience. Uh, we'll start with the gentleman in the back. And I'm going to take two or three at a time and write them down so we can move through them a little faster. Um, please keep it short and please keep it a question. I beg you all. Thank you, sir. Yes. Hi, uh, Rob Lever from AFP. Um, getting back to Prism, there are some things that we don't know about how it works and how companies respond. Can you say with any certainty whether companies like yours have the ability to opt in or opt out? Thank you. Let's go to a couple others and we'll come back. You want me to not answer those yet? Uh, not You're going to take them all? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try to move through them pretty quickly. Uh, let's go to the gentleman in the aisle here. Hi. Uh, I had a quick question regarding Turkey. Uh, Turkish Prime Minister actually criticized Twitter because of the gatherings happened in Turkey. The, about the protest that you mentioned also. And he said Twitter is a menace for all the societies around the world. Even though he was in Silicon Valley and uh, he visited some <coughs> tech companies, including Twitter maybe, or even though he has millions of followers in Twitter. So wh what is your take on this? I mean, how Good, do you see you. it? And, uh, and also a quick question rega regarding the legal basis of this protest. The Turkish police arrested some Twitter users in Turkey. Did they contact you uh, to get some private information mm. about the users and uh, what is your response? Thank you. Let's do one more from this side of the gentleman in the second in from the aisle. Thank you. Rodrigo Valderrama, Plantation International. I have two kids in South America, uh, 13 and 15. Now how is uh, Twitter going to be developing so that they can use this more in their education as well as their social tweets because they're getting into that already. Good. Do uh, you want to talk about opting in or out of PRISM? Yeah, I don't think it's a, uh, and I'm not going to speak specifically about, uh, uh, about the PRISM stuff. I think I've, uh, uh, I'll go back to what I said initially. I won't restate that here, but um, uh, I think I gave about as clear a, uh, a perspective on how we think about these things as possible. You know, we're going to be principled, but abide by the specific rule of law in the countries in which we operate. Alas, folks, I don't think we're going to get much more out of Dick Costello and, uh, on PRISM today. Um, Turkey, are, is Twitter a menace to society in Turkey? Uh, and have you been in touch with any of the folks arrested over there, the um, lawyers? Um, I'm very familiar with uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan's uh, uh, comments and, and the obviously been watching and observing what's been going on there. Um, The beauty of having this open public platform that allows everybody around you to see and hear what you think is that is that <laughs> is, 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 is that it's this public town square. And that's what it is. We don't we don't uh, we don't editorialize what's on it. We don't uh, say, well, if you believe this, you can't uh, you can't use our platform for that. You can use our platform to say what you believe. And so that's what the people of, of, of Turkey and those elsewhere who are commenting on the events Turkey are using the platform for. So it. the platform itself doesn't have any perspective on these things. It's a vehicle for people to use to give their own perspectives. Um, I would say that in response to your other question, one of the, interest, one of the fascinating things about Twitter is um, that since, because you can use a pseudonym, it is 
um, a particularly helpful platform for political speech because you can sign up with your you know, ID. In fact, in Tunisia, one of the protesters was at Slim404, who is now an interior minister in the new government in Tunisia. And you know, we don't ask for a phone number or you know, a, 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 a mailing address or uh, things like that. So the, of course, so it's a great, it's a great platform for uh, the capability to uh, use political speech. Of course, the, the flip side to that coin is it also allows, uh, frankly, for people to behave like trolls with celebrities and you know, say all sorts of horrendous things hiding behind a pseudonym uh, that they might not normally say if they were saying it with their, come, with their full name. I won't forget the education question, which is important, but this is a good time to interject with one that came from online. This may be a silly question, but as a CEO, why isn't your profile verified? <laughs> I always like to give uh, different answers to that question that I get every day, like I'm verified on the inside. That question um, before, you know, <laughs> My mom verifies me, you know. I, 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 you know, we use verification, generally speaking, for things like, um, um, are there, are, it, will it be hard for people to understand which, the, which of these is the real account? Um, are, are there impersonators of this account that make it important for us to verify this account? Uh, um, it, it, and, and then a, 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 sort of several other items on the list. I have, uh, I have long, long felt that um, within the company, we shouldn't just be verifying employees because they work at Twitter um, <coughs> as long as they don't meet some of the other criteria. And uh, since nobody's pretending to be me on the platform, at least not uh, not anything except sarcastically. There are a few. Uh, there are a few uh, uh, fictional internal employee accounts uh, that uh, uh, make fun of me, and uh, uh, that I'm perfectly fine with. Um, but so I just don't think worry about stuff like that. You can get hairy if someone impersonates the Associated Press, as we now know. Well, so they're you know they're well they're they're, they're verified, and most of the major news organizations are verified. That was a case where I think the account got fished and. Uh, uh, we are working closely with um, news organizations now um, in a much more concerted and I think organized way to help them uh, make sure they've got the right sort of security policies implemented around their accounts. Twitter and education, how can Twitter help the Brazilian oh, gentleman's yeah. kids so, in school? Yeah, thanks for coming back to that one. Um, you know, I, I, I think that one of the fascinating things about Twitter is that irrespective of the subject matter in which you're interested, the domain experts are on the platform. And you know, I mentioned Salman Rushdie earlier, but um, there are tons of um, some of the world's greatest authors having conversations about character development or, you know, who's a better South African, you know, novelist? This person, you know, Coates or the, you know, or this person, and. Uh, uh, it's fascinating if you're inter if you're a student of of literature to follow these authors and see the kinds of conversations they have. If you're interested in you know cooking, some the best chefs in the world are on there having conversations about these things. These Arabic scholars are having a. Remember talking to someone from a news organization that was um, researching. Uh, uh, where Mubarak had hidden, you know, assets, and found that the best place to go do research for this report about where Mubarak had, had hidden assets was a set of Arab scholars, Arabic scholars who were discussing this very topic on Twitter. Do you all have an educational division? We have people within our. Um, I guess what we call it our generally call it our media team who focus on specific verticals like news, uh, sports, music, education. And they can't like sign up my school for a Twitter feed. Nonprofits, or whatever, use it as a pedagogically yet. We just have a couple people who work on that stuff, that so it's not a big group. Uh, let's go back to the uh, to the back here. Let's go in the in the. Um, we've got a second from the aisle toward the back. Um, Hi, I'm from Georgia. My name is Julie Girgatz, and not uh, the state Georgia, but country Georgia. And my question is the following, that in my country, it's still not popular to tweet. And there are 
you know, people who use the other social media tools. So what's your strategy to get out there and how do you want to popularize Twitter in countries like Georgia? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's do another couple before we, before we uh, come. The gentleman, um, third from the aisle, about halfway back in the dark suit. Thank you. You mentioned how there's a much anonymous nature to Twitter. The flip side of that is not only the trolls, but also in younger people, the cyberbullying. And I was wondering, what is Twitter doing to combat this growing issue of cyberbullying? Thank you. These are great questions. And uh, on the other side, gentleman in the looks like a blue polo shirt. Joey Herman, University of Michigan. Uh, just a quick question about since its inception, Twitter has been a trendsetter, uh, not only with the hashtag, but now with the inception of Vine. And uh, Facebook just came out with Instagram video, and I just want to know, in regards to that, how you guys look to combat the innovations by your competitors and look to better your own products. Very good. Let's do those three. Uh, so what efforts are you making to popularize Twitter in uh, the Republic of Georgia? Um, we have, <laughs> so we have a, uh, a specific international market development strategy that involves a really a global approach to this um, with focuses on some regions and, and, and countries. Um, and it generally involves um, making sure that we have an app that is fast and functional on the kinds of mobile devices that are um, that are uh, the most you know prevalent in that in that area. Um, you know, in places there are lots of places that smartphone penetration is still very very small um, and will be for some time. There are places in which it is helpful to have uh, relation, direct relationships with the mobile operators who will market your service and app as a part of you know. Using their particular using their particular uh, plans, and so we have gotten, I think, a lot more savvy uh, in the last, I would say, 12 months about doing those kinds of things. I I think it's fair to say that we were a little bit later to doing that than than some of our than some of the other people in the space. Uh, but we you know we think we have a good plan there now, and we'll invest heavily in that. Are there any countries that just don't have Twitter for whatever reason? Well, we're blocked in Iran and China. Um, and uh, we would love to not be blocked there. Obviously, as you as you mentioned, when you talk about Ai Weiwei, there are uh, there are lots of uh, folks in China who who know how to get around that. But uh, we are blocked there, and we would love not to be blocked there. A milestone, like when Coca Cola was in every country after the death of Salazar, when Twitter is in every country in the world. That would be wonderful. Uh, we would dearly love to. Cyberbullying has that issue surfaced inside Twitter. Yeah. So um, the, it's a. The, I I think the 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 point I would make there is that again because it's public, because it's entirely public, um, some of that some of that is alleviated. Yes, you can still be a troll and hide behind an anonymous ID and say something horrible to someone. The a lot of the historic cyberbullying cases have been. Uh, on platforms where it was, you know, a little bit harder for everybody to see what was going on, and it was just within this uh, particular circle of, of people who knew each other, who had access to each other's information. Um, so uh, uh, I, we, have to, we have to do a better job on the at connect experience, your, your reply stream, of filtering out what are obviously just egregious and repeated like harassment. Um, we've been working on that for a little while. It's really a ranking problem. But the challenge there, it's, you, know, you, you might say, OK, well, this, if this person's just saying the same thing over and over again, why don't you pull that out? You want to come up with a scalable solution that doesn't eliminate the serendipity of hearing from someone you've never heard from before who just joined and has zero followers and says this amazing thing to you. That you want to retain that while eliminating the, you know, the the trolling behavior or the abusive behavior. So we're working on that. Um, we've tried to we've tried a, several things. We have another uh, experiment we're running now and and trying out. And uh, it's definitely something that we continue to invest in. And I continue to pay personal attention to because I do think that the flip side to the political speech uh, enabling of using a pseudonym is one that we need to go combat and causes people all sorts of these are, trauma. These are technological solutions? You're yeah, they're technological about. solutions. That's right. Um, video, Facebook, breathing down your neck? Oh, Instagram video. Yeah. Um, 
look, people can do whatever they want to do. You know, like we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to look forward to a point on the horizon that we want to move toward. And uh, the beauty of Vine was that, um, you know, when Dom and Russ and Colin created it, and Jack and I saw it. Jack saw it first. Jack, sorry, Jack Dorsey, a founder, one of the founders of the company of, of Twitter, an inventor of the product, called me and said, "You got to see these guys before they go back to New York." And uh, we, we 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 saw them, and we we bought we bought the company before it even launched, and then uh, changed the product a little bit more before it launched here. We have a very specific notion of where we want to go, and it's this constrained media, public, real-time, conversational, widely distributed, so vines can be distributed anywhere and embedded on sites just like tweets can. And other people can replicate that or take pieces of it they like and pieces of it they don't like and do whatever they want to do, if that's what they want to do. I am, you know, everyone inside the company has heard me say goals, not competitors, all the time. I think it's so much more important to understand the competitive landscape in the context of where you want to go, but not let what those guys are doing drive what you're going to do. And you know, then let the chips fall where they may. No one's ever, you know, if we do what we want to do and go where we want to go, we'll be fine, and everything will take care of itself, and we don't have to worry about. How big that thing is, or how fast this new thing is growing. About that this morning, it's not even clear to me Twitter actually has any real competitors per se. It's just so different from everything else. Um, th here's one from um, from online, which which I love. Um, I hope you can answer this. How can we use wow. Twitter to improve decision making in Congress? <laughs> I don't. I don't. Can't I don't. I know. I don't know what the answer to that is. Not even. The genius from Silicon Valley has the answer to that one. Pass. <laughs> Maybe 140 word, 140 character legislation. Uh, this, this does give me the opportunity to ask, you know, we, we saw a uh, Politico story about uh, Twitter is uh, hashtag lying low, but apparently you've got a Washington operation. You've got seven or eight people here. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's several of them are in the room. Um, we're... Uh, a couple, a couple uh, policy folks here. Um, the rest of the team is doing things like um, helping onboard uh, 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 government, uh, government agencies, um, uh, working with folks in government to better understand the use of Twitter, uh, some sales and sales and marketing folks, folks, etc. So we have a pretty, we still have a pretty small, small group of what folks. What are your here. policy folks doing? Uh, paying attention to the policies that are being developed here in Washington. That's good. Are they lobbying for any particular policies at the moment? Uh, we're, you know, when I'm here, I spend all of, most of my time, as do our policy folks here, listening and just trying to understand the uh, tenor of the discussion on uh, obviously a variety of topics as opposed to angling for anything specific. Um, we're still quite we're still quite small in comparison to some of these other companies. How does Washington look from where you sit? Well, what, in what respect? <laughs> One of the things I've noticed is that people dress up a lot more here, as yeah, Stroke yeah, yeah. well, pointed that. out. I, th I threw you guys by putting a suit on, though, this morning. <laughs> uh, um, I wonder what happens if someone gives you neckties at Christmas. I, you know, I'll, I'll, say, um, I'll say this. It's... I, I think that sometimes the you know we have these if you're in Los Angeles you get these discussions between the difference between Southern California and Northern California when you're in New York or here you get these dis, just differences between East Coast West Coast I think that these tend to be um, exaggerated you know in many in many many ways um, look people in this people here are you know and, it, and it's kind of my answer to the previous question how can twitter be used to be, you know help the government uh, make make better decisions it it is a matter of fact that most of the folks you know most of the representatives most of the senators are already on it and using it and leveraging it quite well and uh, paying very much paying attention to it so i don't think that there's this uh, i don't think that there's really this sense of you know what needs to happen here to make it more like there i just don't i just don't think that way um, people tend to pigeonhole different parts of the world or different parts of the country as being more this than 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 uh, than the, the other guys. And well, I just don't think that's move true. In minutes. Washington moves in years, decades. You know, getting anything through this Congress and so on. 
Um, we have about two minutes left, so I'm going to call on two more people, and one of them is going to be Gary Mitchell, who's always brief, and one other person for quick questions, and we'll do a lightning round. Do we have one other person who wants to get in? Gary first. I thought we were in the lightning round. We're going to the lightning round? Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I write the Mitchell Report, or for this purposes, I'm at Mitch Report. Um, so about uh, a year or so after Disneyland opened, Walt Disney was interviewed and asked, uh, where'd the idea come from? Presumption was that he would say, oh, I created all these marvelous characters and I wanted to build a home for them. Uh, and he didn't, and he didn't hesitate, and he said, oh, it's very simple. I needed a place to take my daughter on the weekends. So uh, where did the idea for Twitter really come from? Yeah, that's one you can answer in 30 yeah. seconds. So uh, Jack Dorsey, again, one of, the, one of the founders and the inventor of the product, had been fascinated by these dispatch systems uh, when he was uh, working uh, in, a, as an engineer and thought it would be compelling to create a system in which you could just broadcast your status or your location or what you needed, and then everyone could see it instead of you know, going through some sort of the, the, as we all know, inefficient queuing mechanisms for taxis as they exist today. And that was the genesis of it, his, his fascination with these dispatch systems and what if you could just broadcast where you were and what you needed and what was happening and the things that would supply you would see that and could rush to you right away uh, and they'd all get the information at once. And he just extrapolated that to, well, wouldn't that be great if everybody could see that and, and you'd be able to jump into those things. And it is a place to take his daughter. Let's do one more. We've got about a minute left. There was a young woman here right behind. Hi, my name is Alina Salyukum with Reuters. Um, you said that you would like to see Twitter be accessed by everyone or accessible to everyone around the world. Part of the challenge there, of course, is not everyone has access to the internet. Does Twitter have any plans to get involved in broadband expansion um, in the US, anywhere around the world, in the sort of kind of network level? I think that we're still a small enough organization that we're we're focused more on the core product itself and know that other companies are, are focused on those efforts. Um, it will probably be some time before we expand in, uh, into anything like that. Um, we work regularly, obviously, with the kinds of companies that are focused on those things. I mentioned relationships with the mobile operators in some of these countries, and we'll probably attack it from that angle, working with the existing providers in those locations as opposed to doing anything ourselves. Here is a last question to sign off on. This came from online. Do you have a favorite personal Twitter moment, a time when you looked at the way the service was used and were just blown away? Well, it, it it changes for me regularly. Um, they happen over and over and over again. Um, I certainly have some favorite Twitter moments, and I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one of them, um, uh, which was, I remember, uh, so Sarah Silverman, the comedian, sent out this tweet that said, um, you know, if your family, if it was around the holidays. She said, if your family is really bugging you around the holidays, just pretend you're in a Woody Allen movie. And, <laughs> And Mia Farrow responded, I tried that, it didn't work. <laughs> so that's probably my favorite Twitter moment. Thank you, Dick Costello, for being with us today.